so basically I'm a macroeconomist and uh, I've done a lot of work in my life on monetary systems and more recently uh, regional development and uh, uh, less developing, the application of these things to less developing countries. And what I want to talk about is briefly to reflect on the current situation. I want to talk a bit about what we mean by currency sovereignty and fiscal sustainability. And I want to talk a bit about the limitations of what, what, I'll, what you'll soon appreciate are pegged monetary systems, of which Timor West that is a pegged monetary system. And I want to talk about uh, the concept of employment guarantees, both conceptually but also some of the experiments. So this is uh, anticipating all the contributions of the afternoon to date, but uh, I was meant to be the fourth speaker, not the, the uh, second. The, the bottom line is that uh, data is difficult to get. Coherent data is difficult to get about the nation. But we know that it, 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 it's a poor nation. We know that illiteracy is very high. We know that uh, malnutrition in children is, is high by, by development standards. Um, we know that the labour market is, doesn't operate very well. We know that uh, 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 all of those things that are drag, that, that uh, are, are the, the, the Millennium Development Goals are not going to be achieved at its current rate of progression. We know that. The exact calibration, not sure, but but this is the thing that I think about is that Timor Leste is a, is a different developing country from many others because many, many, most developing countries are poor by resources and poor by every other indicator. Whereas TL is a very rich nation, but it's also among the poorest. And it's, that's, that's the unique feature of that. Shared other countries are in a similar position, but not many developing countries are in that position. And this, what I call a resource person mismatch, is deliberately exacerbated by the choice of the currency arrangements that have been adopted by the country under pressure from the multilateral agencies, like the World Bank and the IMF. So th there's already this mismatch, and that's exacerbated by the currency arrangements. Even if the currency arrangements were as I think they should be, you'd still get it, you, there's, then there's a, a massive challenge to bring those two things together. But at the moment, the, the conduct of our multinational agencies in, in the country are exacerbating that mismatch. So I want to explain what I think about that, or what I mean by that. So we know it's got significant natural resources. A lot of less developing countries have got no resources. And, and the, the most desperate are, have got no resources and no subsistence agriculture. But Timor's very wealthy, at least for how many years? 15 years or something? The, the petroleum will last at least something like that at the moment on projections. And of course, they've got that wealth despite our own country. The way we've behaved is, you know, to our eternal shame, I think. And, uh, Small developing countries like Timor Leste have better chances than most small developing countries, and it's because of this. It's rich in one case. Now the currency arrangements. Well, we know that it was pressured, and, uh, and Martin was, is going to talk about this in some detail. It was pressured into adopting the US dollar as its official currency when on in the transition. And what that means is that it has no independent monetary policy and it has no independent exchange rate policy. And what that means is that it uses effectively a foreign currency and it has one policy tool with macro policy tool within that foreign currency, which is fiscal policy, upon which to do a whole range of things including development and counter stabilisation in terms of managing the price level. And you know, we teach macroeconomics to our students and we say you need as many policy tools as you've got targets. 
and it's and it's a reflection if you, anyone's done mathematics of the you know you need as many equations as there are unknowns to solve the sort of problem and you can't you you can't solve all of the things that Timor Leste has to solve at the moment with only one policy discretionary policy tool being fiscal policy it has no capacity to set its own rate interest rate it has to accept what the, it, it fluctuates with the US US monetary policy the biggest economy in the world and the, one of the smallest the uh, petroleum fund law of 2005 well to me if you read the English and this is an English translation from the Portuguese well it couldn't be clearer that they're going to they're going to use their wealth and they're going it's owned by the state they own it and they're going to use it for fair and equitable manner according to national interests that's very clear and what any country should aspire to. It's currently got $10 billion invested, approximately, US dollars. The people hold out that it's modelled on the Norwegian model. Well, yes and no. It's, it's certainly a, a natural resource fund in the same way that the North Sea resources of Nor Norway are. And they certainly invested them in foreign assets in the same way that uh, Nor Norway has. But the way in which the, the law was constructed under pressure from these uh, lateral agencies means that the, there's a fundamental problem with, with that fund. In my view, prevent it from fully fulfilling that admirable aim of the, in the preamble of the law. These are the problems. Article 14 says 90% of the fund has to be invested in uh, uh, qualifying instruments. Article 15 then tells you what they are. They're US dollar denominated assets. And there's a, there's a range of assets that they can invest in, but they're all US, 90% have to be in US dollars. And so what that means is that the, not the nominal value of the fund, but the purchasing power of the fund then is dependent upon fluctuations in the US economy. And leading into the crisis, they lost it's just debatable how much was lost, but up to 30% of the purchasing power value of the fund was lost because they were prevented from, say, investing at the time in high-yield Australian bonds. So the Norwegian government doesn't place those sort of constraints on itself. It, it has investment strategies that allow it to seek low-risk, AAA-rated, low-risk in, in US bonds and, and Australian government bonds, zero-risk assets but by chasing yield in this case they're restricted in what are becoming both low yield and because of the exchange rate fluctuating value assets the, the other characteristic of all of these IMF World Bank policy structures this is called the estimated sustainable income and this is uh, defined in the petroleum fund law as that so it's, they, 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 they do some uh, uh, present value of discounted cash flow analysis and they try to work out how long the fund's going to last and what's going, what they can draw out of it. It's sort of like drawing interest out of a capital fund to keep the capital intact. Now, there's no problem with the philosophy that you don't want to squander all your natural resources now if those natural resources are finite. That's, that's okay. But this, is, this, this ESI is, is arbitrarily imposed at 3%. Now, in actual fact, practice, they draw a little bit more out than that. But this becomes what we call in macroeconomics a fiscal rule, that the amount they can only draw out each period, each year, is 3% of, of the fund, which is this ESI. But that's just another word for a fiscal constraint. The government then is under pressure to always meet that and, and I believe under the rules if it doesn't meet that or wants to deviate from that it has to have a, a you know has to plead it like a mendicant to withdraw a bit more of its own money or suffer the the wrath of the IMF visiting team even though the, the neoliberal era has been defined by the imposition of these fiscal rules and, and, and they're becoming more pernicious as we pro progress through history. If we step back and think about them from, from reasonable fiscal practice, fiscal rules are very poor practice. 
because they arbitrarily impose ceilings on the use of fiscal policy, which may be totally counter to the fluctuations across the business cycle that the fiscal policy will have to deal with. The Eurozone is a classic example now. The Stability and Growth Pact that the Maastricht Treaty forced onto the Eurozone members, now 17 of them, the budget deficit couldn't be more than 3% of GDP. And very recently, it's the Frenchman who, the advisor to Mitterrand government at the time, who invented that rule, has admitted that it had no economic logic, that it was just one night they were told to go come back with a rule so that the French could take it to the bargaining table, and they invented 3%. Now then, Pope, that was in the early 90s, and then, then later in the 90s you saw this flurry of research evidence from the European Commission and others uh, uh, trying to justify that fiscal rule ex, you know, ex post. And there was all these fancy modelling exercises and, and, and sophistry in the extreme to justify that rule. But what we know in the current downturn is that the 3% limit that they impose upon budget deficits was blown out of the water by, in most cases by just the cyclical <coughs> movements in the budget. So you know that the budget varies because, not only because government change, government policy with respect to taxation and spending parameters, but also because of the state of the business cycle. So even with a given set of parameters, when the business cycle goes down, economic activity falls, what happens? The government loses tax revenue because tax revenue is a function of economic activity. And so the budget goes either smaller surplus or a bigger deficit without the government doing anything. And, and the other thing is they pay out more in welfare support and income support in a downturn. And of course when the economy goes into an upturn, the budget swings the other way without them doing anything. That's the cyclical, the automatic stabilisers as economists call them. Now in countries in the current crisis, we won't call it the previous crisis because it's still going, those cyclical effects blew the fiscal rule out of the water. They were more than 3%. And, and then the response of the European Commission and the European Central Bank and the IMF, the so-called Troika, was to say, OK, you've got, to, you've got to now impose fiscal austerity. What that meant in this context, when your economy is declining and pushing your budget deficit up because of the stabilisers, then you impose discretionary austerity, which is what we call pro-cyclical. The economy is going backwards, yet you're contracting fiscal policy. And that is the exemplar of irresponsible fiscal practice. And that's driven solely by the imposition of these fiscal rules and Australia's budget surplus obsession is an exactly a similar example. We're going, we're slowing down. The east coast of Australia is probably close to recession now, yet the government's going to run a surplus at all costs when it should be increasing its deficit. And that's because it's adopted this fiscal rule. And in Timor Lester's case, the, the ESI, the, the estimated sustainable income, means that it can't use its petroleum fund to accelerate infrastructure spending. And so what it's doing is spending significant amounts on infrastructure, but within this constraint. And so really they're prolonging unemployment, food dependency and poverty. When what we know about the development process is that it's very non-linear. And you've got to get in there very quickly and, and start shaping that in a non-linear way. And so you know, you can't rely on the fact you'll, you'll have that the development process will be an adequate one if you're just going to have 3%, 3%, 3%. It's, it's, it's very likely you need to take lots more out of the petroleum fund now and build the structure of the economy, the domestic structure, through education, through cooperatives in agriculture to, to reduce the food dependency, import replacement, as Daniel said, and, and get the domestic economy producing and then, later on, you'll find that the draw out of the fund will be probably smaller than 3%. But it's that inflexibility the fiscal rules impose that lead to suboptimal sub outcomes. And in this nation's case, the prolonging of the worst aspects of underdevelopment.
Now the other thing, so the IMF does a chapter four visit. These are regular things and nothing controversial in a way. If you read their latest chapter four statement, which came out I think in February, what they're now starting to say is that, okay, it's all very good that the government in Timor-Leste is spending and developing, they're very admirable, but it's spending too much because inflation's rising, this is their argument. And they've got to get back to what they call a fiscal sustainable position, which means they want to impose relative austerity on the country. If you think about why they've got inflation, this becomes a highly nonsensical thing for the IMF to be recommending. Austerity at a time when it's meant to be growing and, and building capacity, they want to cut back that growth process. The inflation is mostly tied up with the dollarisation the choice of the currency unit. And so, for example, Timor Leste is dependent a lot on imported food and imported commodities. So they import a lot from our country, Australia. Now, what's been happening to Australia's exchange rate over the last 10 years, well, we've gone from, I remember our American friends used to call us the half-price country because we, our exchange rate in around 2000 was 49 cents US. And they were laughing coming out to visit me saying we're half price. Well, now what are we? We're over a parity. You know? And the problem is that if you tie your currency to the dollar, then they're facing massive increases in, in imported costs just purely because of the currency rate. If they had a floating exchange rate, that wouldn't be going on in the same way as that. Now, then you get this argument that developing countries can't afford to live beyond their means. I always reply when I'm at meetings when that comes up. If you've got 15% unemployment, about, and then massive underemployment hidden in the agricultural sector, you know, classic sort of Lewis type underemployment, then you can't then tell me you're living beyond your means. You've got massive idle resources, you can therefore afford more employment because you've got all these wasted resources. You're living below your means not beyond the means. And so therefore the inflationary bias that the IMF talks about can't be a normal aggregate demand type story where, where we spend nominal aggregate demands moving too quickly in relation to supply capacity. It's tied up with the currency arrangements. And fiscal policy can't have been too expansionary if you've got this massive pool of workers that are not working. Those two things, they just don't make any sense to a, a person who sits outside the IMF type ideology. And so fiscal restraint is not the solution when a country is living vastly below its mean. The relevant question is, what is the desirable macroeconomic aims for a sovereign government that enjoys a currency issuing monopoly? That's always the question a developing country has to ask itself. Not what its budget deficit is, not what its public debt ratio is, that's the first starting point. And so you'll note if that's the first starting point, well then that's part of the starting point. The first thing a country should do that is either dollarising, using another currency, or pegging the exchange rate to another currency like Argentina was, for example, at the time of the crisis, the first thing they should do is unpeg and issue its own currency. What does that allow it to do? Well, that allows it, first of all, to enjoy the fiscal capacity that having your own currency brings. And that means that they can always ensure a full use of domestic resources. Fiscal policy then is, you, you, you can run then, once you have your own currency, you can run your independent monetary policy, you, can, you should let your exchange rate float, and then fiscal policy is free to target domestic development in the way that it should. At the moment, the government in, in our neighbour is unable to do that because it's pegged that it's using a foreign currency. In the same way that the Eurozone nations are not able to get out of their crisis because they're using a foreign currency. The Euro is foreign to each one of them because none of them issue it. And the only way in which the European economy, the Eurozone is staying afloat at the moment is because the European Central Bank is the currency issuer and it's bailing them out but at the cost of imposing austerity onto these users of foreign currency. And in answering these questions, these are the things that are important. <coughs> Full employment and price stability and environmental sustainability. 
and to get these things, restoration of currency sovereignty is an imperative. The second thing is that in a society like this, where a majority of citizens in, in the country live in a pre-capitalist subsistence agriculture state, first thing, if you want to avoid that primitive state of capitalism and push the economy along, is once you've got full currency sovereignty, is then to issue large-scale public works employment program. And what does that mean when you're reading the literature on fiscal sustainability? All they're talking about is some numbers relating to budget outcomes or public debt ratio. The, the whole debate has become concentrated in terms of these financial indicators, which to an economist like me have no meaning unless I know the context. A budget deficit of 10% of GDP could be exactly appropriate, just as much as a budget surplus of 3% of GDP or 12% of GDP. I've got to know the context to know whether that, that's the correct position, and that's why imposing a fiscal rule is a nonsensical thing because it's, a, it's devoid of context. So fiscal sustainability has to be seen in context. A budget is, not, is a vehicle, it's not an end. <coughs> It's not an end in itself. A budget is just a, an accounting statement of what the government's done, hopefully to fulfil its goals that we want it to fulfil. And you know, in a developing country or an advanced country, this has to be a starting point. So to worry about what the budget is without worrying about what it's in relation to, which is what the majority of the debate about fiscal sustainability is about, is just nonsensical and reflects the sort of neoliberal ideology that dominates the economic profession over the last 30 years. Now these are all the things that accompany a government that issues its own currency that most people don't understand. A government that issues its own currency is never revenue dependent. That is, it, it never has to fund its spending in the same way that a household is, you and I use the currency, the government creates it. The neoliberals want us to believe that the government is like a big household. Well, no, it's not. We use the currency. If we want to spend it, we've got to make sure we've got an income or we've got savings to draw down on or we can borrow from someone or we can sell some assets. They are four means of being able to spend. The government doesn't have to do any of those things to spend because it issues the own currency, its own currency. Now that's not the same thing as saying the government should spend an infinite amount. The government should run a budget deficit or a budget position that's commensurate with full employment. And that means that if the non-government sector, the household sector and the external sector, is not able to create demand sufficient to produce enough jobs, well then that spending has to come from government. Spending equals income, and from income you get job creation. Now typically, a sovereign nation like Australia will run a budget deficit. And that's because there's usually a external deficit, current account deficit, draining demand from the local economy. And the private sector, the domestic sector, us typically desires to save overall. And, and if it desires to save overall, there's a drain on spending as well in the economy. Now, if those two things come together, the government has to run a deficit or the economy will go into recession. And from 1945 to, you know, until Keynes started to be obsessed with, uh, with, with running surpluses, the Australian government ran deficits. In America, same, you know, 85% of the years after the Great Depression, the federal government in America ran deficits, as did all the advanced countries. Now, Norway's different. It can run budget services, still keep growth going strong enough to have the private sector able to save overall. Why? Because its current account is in such a large surplus. Same for Timor Leste. It's easier for a government to manage its fiscal policy when it's got a huge spending influx coming in from its external sector via exports. It's the net exports. And this, this petroleum wealth takes all the pressure off its budget because it's a massive amount of spending capacity coming into the economy that allows it both to create full employment, allow the private sector to develop savings and risk management behaviour as, as 
as more and more become familiar with the monetary side of the economy, that allows them to fund new ventures like cooperative agriculture, to allow the agriculture sector to become, I'm not talking about agribusiness here, you know, big business, you know, food income, I'm not talking about that sort of agricultural development, which is the IMF model, the export-led model, where you turn subsistence agriculture into cash crops and then wreck the joint. I'm talking about uh, proper cooperatives with uh, uh, improving productivity in the agriculture sector through cooperative measures and with the aim of achieving high nutritional standards and, and uh, self-sufficiency. That needs investment. It doesn't grow out of the air. And so the Timor Leste government's got the capacity to do that. Most <coughs> developing countries, most advanced countries don't have that capacity. They've got to run deficits to do that. The Timor government doesn't have to do that. And it makes it, the development process a little bit easier. Still challenging, but from a fiscal point of view, easier. And as I say here, the gains from returning to currency sovereignty and freeing up its policy instruments, in other words, allowing it to run an independent monetary policy and exchange rate policy, will also reduce the inflation pressures. Now finally, talking about job guarantees, there's two options that any country can adopt to maintain price stability. They can either use an unemployment buffer stock approach. In other words, if you want to discipline the price setting process in an economy, you just make sure there's a, a, a buffer stock of unemployed people. And so what we've seen in, in advanced countries dominated by neoliberal thinking <coughs> and uh, the concept mainstream in my profession propagate is that the, the shift in about the mid-80s, certainly accelerated in the 1990s, was that unemployment, when I grew up, used to be a policy target. That is, the government used to aim to keep unemployment below 2% and everybody could get a job. And then as this paradigm shift occurred, unemployment became a policy tool to be used by the central bank under inflation targeting to keep <coughs> inflation low. That's one approach. And the bottom line is this is extremely costly in terms of lost income opportunities because having people not doing anything as from a macro point of view is just a waste of resources. But it's also incredibly damaging to the individuals and their families. There's a whole range of other pathologies that accompany unemployment that are very rarely, rarely costed or thought about and are huge. This strategy is unbelievably costly and ultimately it doesn't necessarily work because you've got to keep ratcheting up the unemployment because the pool of unemployed lose the capacity as a threat to those that remain employed. That's a separate issue. The alternative that you can use is the opposite. You can run an employment buffer stock. And this is what I call the job guarantee. What that means is this is a vastly superior way in which you can manage labour that isn't going to be employed immediately in the private sector. Essentially what it is, it's an unconditional job offer. This is the pure model. An unconditional job model of a public job at some reasonable minimum wage to anyone who wants to work. So it's, the government will just come out one day and announce anybody who wants a job at this minimum wage has been worked out to satisfy all nutritional standards and, and be sufficient for social inclusion. Go down to the depot. Uh, bypass Centrelink and go to the job guarantee office and you'll get a job. When Australia had true full employment, that is 2% unemployment, we effectively ran an implicit job guarantee because anybody on any day could go and get a job in a range of different places, government utilities, the transport system, the road, rails, uh, local government. In Melbourne where I grew up you could always get a job at the Spencer Street where I go on any day you wanted it. That was a job guarantee. That was a buffer stock of jobs, always being above. You were paid a very low wage at the rail yards, the minimum wage used to be called the basic wage in Australia, but you could always get a job. And remember that this can't be inflationary in its own self because what you're purchasing is labour that has ze what, what a market economist will say zero bid. Nobody wants these like The private sector doesn't want to employ these people, otherwise they'd be employed. So if you employ them at some decent minimum wage, you can't be disturbing the wage structure and you can't be taking labour off anybody who wants it. 
because all they have to do is pay more than the legally minimum wage and bid them away. And this is an incredibly useful way to start a development process because jobs can be constructed to suit anybody. You can provide training structures within the jobs. You can employ people with disabilities because we've done a lot of work with, uh, ment on mental health and, and, and employment structures. The private sector doesn't employ people with episodic illnesses. But a job guarantee could do that. And I remember this is an important one. I remember someone said, how are these productive jobs? And you know what I've got, the workers would do useful things. And someone said to me, oh, look, these are just make work, you know, the normal sort of arguments about government work. And I said to them, well, even if the person who was walking out the door each morning, the adult, went off and did virtually nothing, there's still tremendous productivity in that job because the children see the father or the mother going to work and they're learning essential habits because the research literature is very powerful that uh, children who grow up in jobless households inherit all the disadvantages of the parents. And, they, and when they're adults, they have unstable work histories, they have increased incidence of alcohol and substance abuse, they have increased uh, family instability and higher divorce rates and all the rest of it. So even if the parents didn't do anything, the children <coughs> see them doing it as if they're doing something. Tremendous intergenerational advantage. So last few points. It's often said it's not suitable for developing countries. Well, yes it is. Sorry. If a developing country has the capacity to buy all the labour that wants to work, well then of course it's an imperative for a developing country. The, the twofold development strategy that we, we talked about when we were working in South Africa was that you've got the, the, the adults of the apartheid who were deprived of education and training and decency by the apartheid system are probably too far gone to be, be transformed from illiterates to medical practitioners probably too big a ask in their lifetime. And, but they can certainly work and develop skills and self-esteem and income independence. So the imperative is a job guarantee allows them to get into work. And then the next part of the development strategy is to get the kids into education. And you saw Daniel's uh, demographic distributions. There's this massive number of young people in Timor that in 10 years' time are going to be in the labour force. For God's sake, what are they going to do? When I've been to meetings where multilateral agency officials have said, oh, it's too costly, I then ask the question, what does it cost? And they say, and they quote me budget figures on what it might cost. And I turn around and say, well, the numbers that are going to budgets are not costs. They're just nominal numbers. The true costs of any government program is the real resources that are used in the implementation of that program. So for the workers, the extra food, the extra materials that are required. And once you start thinking about the costs of a program are real, not nominal, then you have a different set of appraisals to go and work out whether the country can afford it. And if you've got 15% of your population unemployed and you're sitting on $11 billion US you know, petrol fund, then you can certainly afford a job guarantee at a decent minimum wage for anyone who wants to work. Later on, Daniel might want to talk a bit more about the Heifers program in Argentina. The National Rural Employment Guarantee in India has employed millions of people in the last decade under these sort of policies. And the program that Daniel and I worked on was the Expanded Public Works program in South Africa. This has been a massive success. This is a guaranteed number of hours of work. It's, it's budget constrained, unfortunately. But all the participants who worked in that program were really low-skilled workers and they created new roads, drains, sewers, urban infrastructure that if you go to South Africa you'll see that some parts are extremely wealthy and then the rest has got nothing because of apartheid. Just nothing. No footpaths, no, no transport systems, nothing. And this program literally employed a million people in its first five years on labour-intensive community development projects. And everybody in our evaluation I did for the ILO, everybody who participated in that program moved above the poverty line. 
And what we also found was that the family dynamics changed a little bit because the parent had some income, the child had a better continuity in schooling. They had some books and clothing that they didn't previously have. And we've had lots of discussions about that program with engineers in the public works program. And these are engineers that have been trained in Britain and in America. And of course, they sit down and they, they look at you and they say, you're mad at the cut and low intensity road building. Daniel alluded to it, you know, all these people rock up to Timor Leste and ship with all these machines where you've got to get 200 men per kilometre bashing in rocks for the dirt. And they turn around and say, we're not, we're, you know, we've moved beyond that, we've got technology now. And they say, you wouldn't do that in Australia. That's one bloke said to me, you wouldn't do that in Australia. I said, yeah, but we did 50 years ago. And the vast majority of your country is still back there, even though Pretoria and some parts of Johannesburg are not. And so these programs have real flexibility to employ large numbers of very unskilled workers and provide them with income security and a guaranteed income but with the benefits of a job and all the social benefits that flow from that. And that has to be a, a, a minimum in a development process. Restating, in my view, the country's been had, the development process has been hampered by the neoliberal currency arrangements. If, they, if they're serious about development, they've got to abandon the dollar, introduce their own currency, float their own exchange, float the exchange rate, and set their own interest rates. And it should abandon the CSI fiscal constraint, and it should introduce a large-scale public work program. Then, to me, the elements of a successful development strategy, there's much more needed. These aren't the panaceas, these are just the basic framework that alters the basic framework they've got in place now, which is neoliberal inspired and won't get them to the goals. Development plan says they'll become a high-end middle-income country by 2030. Well, no, they won't if they go the way they go. So I'll, I'll leave it there, thank you.